It's not easy. We're not going to stand up here and say it's easy. But I will tell you that it's worth fighting for. And it is a joyful experience that each one of you is made for. You're not made for gratification that comes and goes. You're made for love. And we, we talk about love, I think, from a guy's perspective. Um, you know, love, I think, of flowers. You know, it's not really a guy thing. Um, you know, so, so what, what does it mean to love as a guy? How am I directing towards you guys? How do we love as a guy? What, what the heck is that all about? So often we see today of what these men are, and they're, they're all the guys is, is having sex with as many girls as you can. It's how can you manipulate someone to get what you want? It's almost like that men have become these sexual animals. You know, I, I always think about, um, I, I work here, but I travel to the East Coast sometimes, and I was in Washington, D.C. for a work trip, and afterwards I was hanging out with one of our coworkers, and he had this, this dog named Einstein. He was this white little fluffy dog from the, 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 the stray they found, and they adopted him into their home. And as soon as I walked in their house, Einstein really liked me for some reason. I don't know what it was. But as soon as he saw me, he immediately beelined towards me and began humping my left leg. <laughs> and everyone's, I'm kind of standing there, everyone thinks it's hilarious. Uh, here's a dog just humping my leg. And I eventually kicked him off. And I, I kid you not, the rest of the night, no matter where I went throughout the room, Einstein was locked on me, and every time I moved, he would catapult himself onto my leg again. And the whole night, he was just humping me. For some reason, I don't know what it was. It was really embarrassing, but that is an animal that can't control himself. Believe it or not, men are not animals. We have free will. We talk about manhood. And what is it? You think about, you know, what are some true men you guys look up to? I, I think about, we've got Braveheart here on the far right. I think about uh, some of my friends who are Navy SEALs right now. I've got two very devout Catholic guys who are right now risking their lives uh, to defend our country. Who, who are going through hell. Guys who are, you know, physically training, working as hard as they can um, to defend this country. That's what a man is. And that is someone who is willing to risk his life for this country. And we talk about what is manhood. It's willing to risk your life for them. That's what it is. It's, it's finding someone and saying, I will the good of them. And to do so, I'm going to lay down my life. We have one of my favorite readings comes from Ephesians 5. St. Paul. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We talk about this gift of self, of offering a self. It's not using. I'd say what, if you go out there and have sex with someone, if you guys go off to college, or maybe even now, it, it's not hard to find someone to have sex with. I'll tell you that. Um, it's not hard. There's nothing manly about that. Um, you're basically manipulating someone to, to give what you want. And that's not what you guys are made for. Um, you guys are made for something much more than that. Part of the reason I think I struggled with this was that as guys, we had this thing to, uh, to want to conquer, to want to do something. And, and all I was being told, at least I thought, was that I can't do these things, you know? I, I can't have sex. I can't do this. I felt so, um, you know, repressed, and I couldn't do these things. And Matthew Kelly, he's an author, he says differently that for every no, we're actually saying yes. So it's not, it's not, no, I can't, I can't have sex with them. It's, it's, yes, I'm going to choose to be a man that stands up for her dignity. 
It's, yes, I'm going to be a man that's not going to be controlled by my passions. It's, yes, I'm going to choose to wait for my wedding night. Yes, I'm going to choose to be different. That's what manhood is. I, 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 I know um, well, someone here tonight talked about, they heard Mike Sweeney speak the other night. I heard him speak down in Chula Vista the other day. The other day. And about a couple of months ago, there was a men's conference with Philip Rivers and Mike Sweeney. You guys know Philip Rivers. And um, two great Catholic guys. And they were talking in front of a, a thousand guys about what it means to be a man. These guys are both very devout guys and have loving families. And they were talking about the temptation they face. After all the games, these women just throwing themselves at these guys left and right. But how they have chosen a different path. And the joy that comes with living that lifestyle. And so, I'm talking here tonight to challenge you guys to be men. And to be a man is to protect the other. Is to lay down your life and to sacrifice. And there is honor in that, and there is joy in that. And that's what we're all made for. Yes, and women, do not settle for a man who wants to manipulate or use you. For your body. No. I pray every single day that the Lord send me a man after God's own heart. A man who will lead, provide, and protect. And by that, we're not talking about like the breadwinner or uh, you don't have to go to war necessarily. I mean a leader, provider, and protector in the spiritual life. So that when I'm 45 and we have five kids and I'm like, I want to go to bed. I'm so tired. I don't want to pray my rosary. My husband's like, sweetie, like, why are we here? I'm here to lead you to heaven, right? I want my husband to be a spiritual leader, and they're out there. I want to share with you guys something really cute that happened. I'm going to pull this out of my bag right here. Okay, so this was last Thursday. I went to run an errand. I had to pick up a paycheck from a job that I just resigned from. And so I pull up in my car, and... I run in really quick to get my paycheck and I come back out and next to me in the car is a gentleman who I worked with and he's in the process of becoming Catholic. He's 23 years old. He's an RCIA and so I'm like, I see him in the window and I'm like, hey Derek, like, you know, we work together and it's been two weeks since I quit my job so I haven't seen him and I'm like, how are you doing? And girls, I'm not saying I'm going to marry this guy, but he was, this is just so wonderful. He had his rosary hanging around his rear view mirror. He had his holy cards scattered all over the car seat next to him. And he's reading this little red book that says prayers. I mean, like, come on. Holiness is attractive, guys. Like, no guy who wants to use me will be my husband. No. So ladies, don't settle. Then the funny part of the story is I get, so I'm like, okay, bye-bye, Derek. I get back in my car, and on my car seat is this little cut piece of paper. And it looked like he had, like, cut it, and he was, like, putting it on multiple people's car windows or something. I don't know. This is, like, a totally normal guy. All right, let me read it to you what it says. So I get in my car, drive away, and then I pull from, like, underneath. I'm like, what is this? Okay, so I read it. It says, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know well the plans I have in mind for you. Plans for welfare and not for woe. So as to give you a future of hope. And then it has a little commentary. With courage you will dare to take risks. Have the strength to be compassionate and the wisdom to be humble. Courage is the foundation of integrity. And I said to myself, I was preparing for this talk, and I said to myself, gosh darn it, I want to share that with them. Because that is a man who lead, provides, and protects. And Brock has no idea what's going on. Because when we practice this, this part wasn't in there. Because this just happened. And I'm not saying I want to marry this guy, but this is what men, this is how all men should be. Leaders in the spiritual life. Okay, they should tell you the truth, women. And this is the truth, right here. You are beautiful, you are enough, and you deserve to be loved. That's the truth. And why is that the truth? Because we don't feel like this sometimes, right? I told you, Jesus started to reveal to me that this was the truth. And I'm going to share with you just a little snippet of something he revealed to me. I was listening to a Christopher West CD. I know you guys are learning about theology of the body. Do you know who Christopher West is? Maybe. Okay, so he says, this little teaching, girls, you're going to love this. This is like my favorite thing ever. He says, 
women are God's masterpiece. I'm like, I'll take it. Okay, so let me explain. Let's think, do we have any artists in here? Anyone like to paint or draw? I like to paint or draw, kind of. So if we have any artists who know like the technical terms for pieces of art, we know that a masterpiece is a really, it has like a deeper meaning. It doesn't just mean like a beautiful piece of art. It means an artist's last and final work. And it's a summary of like everything the artist has done. And it summarizes who the artist is as a person before he, you know, it's his legacy. Okay, so let's think of God as an artist. Let's think of the creation story. And we know on day one, God made the skies and the oceans, and then day two and day three. And on the last day, God made human beings. And so we can say in general, yes, all human beings, every single one of you guys in this room, are God's masterpiece. You are made in the image and likeness of God. That means you're like God in all his beauty, his goodness, truth. So, yes, all of human, all of humanity. But who was made last, last? Women. So, and my dad said this all the time. He's like, clearly, women are more beautiful. They just are. Their hair is silky. They take care of their nails. Right? They just are. Their voices are soft and sweet and high-pitched. I mean, my dad's saying this. Okay. So it's just a fact of life. Like, we never have to worry about men wearing belly button shirts, right? Because it's just women. We just, they're so beautiful. So women are God's masterpiece. Why else are women God's masterpiece? What, what makes women so unique that men can't do? What can we do? Babies. You guys, babies, that's like my favorite word in the whole world. Babies are a miracle. Do you know why? Because they have a soul. A soul that doesn't just go away after 70 years of life, 80 or 90 years of life. A soul lives on for eternity. Women are life bearers. That is so special. That is so special. But why do we sometimes not feel like that special? Women. Why sometimes do we not feel beautiful enough? Why sometimes does the world tell us if you have a life growing inside you, get rid of it, it's not important? Why is that? Because something happened in the beginning, and you know the story. What happened is the enemy, God's enemy, Satan, came into the garden, Adam and Eve, and who did he go after first? Yeah, not because woman is stupid and she's going to fall for his tricks. No, because woman, with the consent of a woman, a new person can be brought into the world to love and serve God. And who does Satan hate? God. He wants to bring us down, you guys. He wants to bring us down to hell. Abort the baby. I don't want any more of them, he says. And so he tempted woman on that first day to say, God doesn't really love you. He doesn't really know what will make you most happy. And, and still today, we think that God maybe doesn't even exist, right? We don't trust God, that he has plans for our life, right? And so the same thing has happened, you guys. Satan is still deceiving us to this day. He's telling us you're not enough. You're not important. The life within you is not important. And men, you know what he's telling you today? What? <laughs> Sit back and relax. It doesn't matter. Let Satan go after the woman. Woman, do you want men to fight for you? Yes. Men, fight for us. We all are called. Do not be deceived. This is serious. He's the father of lies. He's the father of lies. And I put up here a hashtag, ask Mary for help. Because Mary is God's most beloved daughter, virgin daughter who conceived the savior of the world. And Satan despises Mary. 
But Mary, with her dainty little feet, what does she do? She crushes his head. So ask Mary for help. When, you, when those feelings creep up, like this isn't important, this God stuff doesn't matter. Because heads up, you guys, why are you here today? God is willing you into existence at this moment. If he didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here, right? So God has everything to do with love. He has a plan for your life. Okay, we're gonna do another video. If I unplug the headphones. So what's the big deal, right? Well, why is this a problem? It's just me doing it for myself. No one's looking at me. What's the big deal? Well, I, we're, we're going to talk about the one thing I'll talk about. Pornography and masturbation can be very addictive. Uh, very addictive. And I'm going to talk about my own struggles with this in a moment. Um, but... There's been a lot of, of, of recent studies out there that have shown that when you look at pornography and masturbate, there are chemicals in your brain called dopamine. Uh, it basically convinces your body that you're having sex. That's what it does. And these studies have been taken MRIs of the brain before and after, and they've shown how pornography is more addictive than cocaine and meth. It's very, very addictive. So why is this a problem? 
Well, what's the big deal? Well, we talked about what love is. Pornography is the complete opposite of love. To love is to give. Pornography teaches you to use someone for your own sexual gratification. And what it does is it trains your mind into thinking this is what love is. This is what I should be experiencing. I will tell you from experience that I still have images in my mind from years ago that do not go away. The images stay there with you time and time again. Pope John Paul II said the reason pornography is wrong is not that it shows too much of a woman, but that it shows too little. It reduces her to just a sexual object. And that's not what they are. They're not sexual objects. They're more than that. And when you look at pornography, one time, it's usually looking at multiple women, multiple guys. Not just one, it's multiple things again, again, again. Because one just isn't enough. Um, it goes again and again. I'll, I'll talk about, you know, they say that uh, most men first start seeking pornography when they're 12 years old. Um, I struggled with this when I was in, in middle school, um, looking at uh, images and then in high school, pornography and masturbation became uh, a daily routine. Um, I'm not proud to say it, but I'll be honest with you, it has. I've struggled with this, and so have made many of you, uh, both guys and girls. It's not just a guy struggle, women struggle with it as well. I, I talked about how when I was in college, I had my conversion, and I uh, went to the faith. And I got a lot of new friends, and I, did a, I changed a lot of things about my life. But I still struggle with this. I still struggle with masturbation pornography. It still would not leave me. And no matter how hard I wanted to try to get rid of it, it had a hold of my life. It did. I struggled with it for a long time. And after after graduate college, I've, I've struggled with it still to this day. Um, I, I've, I've had some accountability software on my phone and on my computer. I've tried having friends. I've gone to confession time and time again, and yet it still can, can put a hold on me. And, and I'll talk about um, where it kind of reached its climax for me. I was on, on a work trip on the East Coast again, I found a way around uh, my software. I told myself, okay, I'm not, not going to look anything, I'm not going to do anything. Before I knew it, I was looking at pornography again. And as soon as I looked at it, I said, okay, you know, I'm done. I'm not going to like look at it again. Within 10 minutes, I was looking at it again. And that entire week, uh, before work, I couldn't wait to get home from work to my hotel. I was looking at it again and again. It's one of those helpless feelings to where you know you shouldn't be looking at it, you shouldn't be doing it, but you can't stop. Um, I felt embarrassed. I felt hopeless. I felt like I could never, ever overcome this. I remember reaching out to a friend of mine who talked about praying the rosary. Uh, I can stand before you and say that I've prayed the rosary almost every single day since. And I have not looked at pornography and had masturbated over a year. And, and that... But it's what God's allowed me to do. I'll be real honest with everyone. This is a real issue. I, I, I actually, I go to um, a meeting, you can call it per se, over at the Rock Church. And it's a bunch of guys who are struggling with pornography. And these guys have some real serious issues. You talk about a woman, how, how Megan felt when she sat her boyfriend looking at Sports Illustrated, February 2007, whatever month it was. When your wife or your girlfriend finds out about this, she's going to be devastated. I can personally attest that my girlfriend found out about it. And she was devastated, crushed. I felt like I was cheating on her all the time. But, but to me, it wasn't a big deal. Hey, you know, I wasn't cheating on you. But to them, it is you are using it. I, I literally go to these meetings and these guys who are there, some of them are divorced, 
But what started out as pornography became the slippery slope that then led to prostitution, that then led to adultery, that led to all these other things. And if you, if you think that you're strong enough for it, if you think that it's, it's not going to get to you, or it's not a big deal, if there's one thing I, I hope you guys take away from this. I, I'm very passionate about this because it has affected me in a lot of ways, and I know how it's affected so many others. But I tell you how evil pornography is, and I beg you to not go down that route. And if you have, if you've gone down that route, if you're struggling with it, I tell you, you're not alone. And I tell you, there is hope from this. Because each one of you out there, you are not made for masturbation. You're not made for pornography. You guys are made for love. You guys are made for something more than that. And you talk about giving yourself if you can't control yourself, you have nothing to give. So if you can't control your body, if you can't choose what, how, you, how you react, then how can you give that to your future spouse? Also, we talk about um, you know, the, the industry, of what is the pornography industry. There's been interviews done, some of you may have known Matt Fratt or some other Catholic guys out there doing interviews with these performers. And Almost all these performers are miserable. They're on drugs. They're because they're being put on stage and they have to use these things just to get through the, the scenes. They have all these stats about how 66% of the, of the performers have herpes. All these performers have STDs and whatever you guys and girls, and whatever we submit and watch these things, we're supporting an industry that is completely against what the Catholic Church stands for. And I'm standing up here not to, to, to come down, not to say, to yell at anyone, I'm just here to talk about uh, how dangerous it is and that there is hope. We're going to talk about what can you do. The rosary is so powerful. Memorizing scripture, praying, all these things about how, how to love and about having that relationship with God, that is what's going to help us overcome it. Uh, but uh, we have some, some resources that we're going to hand out at the end about some websites you can look at. Um, but I just want to talk about how it is a serious thing, but there is hope uh, and there is healing from this. Okay. On the topic of our bodies that are so beautiful. Does anyone know why a woman on her wedding day wears a veil that covers her face initially and then the groom removes it? Or why the woman wears white? Purity, Purity yeah. You're exactly right. So the church is so cool because I think the, the Catholic Church is probably the one that came up with these, these customs. But they're symbols of that the woman, her whole life before marrying this man, she wears white because she's kept herself pure. She's kept her body pure. She's kept her speech pure. Right? She's wrapped herself in modesty. In the veil, she's veiled her body in modesty, veiled her speech. Right? And let me explain that. We don't clothe, we don't, you know, we don't have to, we don't dress modestly to cover ourselves because we are our bodies are dirty no or because they're not worthy of being looked at no it's actually the opposite you guys we are so beautiful women that we veil our bodies for our future husbands to give it to them fully as a gift this is like it's almost like you're keeping a secret until your wedding day. But how would it be if someone told you, you know, keep, keep a secret, but then you just tell everyone the secret before the person that the secret was meant for? Is that a secret? No. And this is even more beautiful than a secret. It's your body that was made in God's image and likeness. So, ladies in particular, why then do we wear the shorts up to here? 
or the low cut shirts. Why? You don't have to say, because I'll say, because I've done it. We say it, and boys, you should pay attention here. We do those things, oftentimes, because we want your attention. We want that instant gratification of you gawking at us. But ladies, that is not love. Do not settle for that instant gratification. That is not love. But we do it because so often, men, we're not told that we're beautiful enough. Except for my roommate, one time. She was driving, two weeks ago, in her little drop-top car. And she gets up to the stoplight. And she's sitting at the light. This guy drives up next to her. And he looks over. She was just sitting right back there, so she's smiling. He looks over, and she's like, tells me, she's like, I was like scared to look over there, scared to look at him, because I don't know, you know, I don't know what he's gonna say. And so she finally looks over, and he says to her, he can only see her head, like here. He says, you are beautiful. And, my, and Lisa was like, what? Because he looked her straight in the eye, not at her body, and he said she was beautiful. And then the light turned green and he drove away. <laughs> right? This man is what we need. Women, it's not even love. If he's just looking at your body, yes, it's instant gratification. But that is not love. Again, that's a feeling that will come and go away. And oh no, what would happen if you thought you were in love? Like you dated this guy and he always was telling you how beautiful you were just because he was trying to... I don't know, wasn't really loving you, maybe? What if you ended up getting married to him? Oh no, then what happens after the third baby if you gain 40 pounds? Does he love you anymore? Yes. Yes, good answer. Hopefully you will, that's true love. I like it. So women, my point is, let me get this slide back up here. My point is, women, respect and love yourself first. It's all about knowing that you are loved first. So on the point, this is I'm gonna use a little example here to illustrate what I, what I mean by know that you are loved first. And I'm gonna talk about the selfies that we post on Facebook and Instagram. Oh my word, un momentito. I'm going to talk about the selfies that we post with everything hanging out all over the place. I hope you don't, but if you do, know first, know first that Jesus looks at those selfies, he sees them, he sees everything, he looks at those and do you know what he says? He's like, oh my. If only you knew how beautiful you were to me. That's what he thinks. And so if we knew how valuable we are, think to yourself. Instead of thinking, is this too short or is this too low cut? This should be the question, you guys. Do I believe that I am loved? That's the question. That's what I ask myself when this when the enemy creeps in and he says, you have to dress this way to get attention. And I say,